being the ministry assistant here at Grace Baptist for the last 17 years. The story of Esther shows how God works through Esther, even the seemingly tragic things that happened, how she started out. I'm almost heartbroken when I start out reading the story of Esther. She starts out, both of her parents have died, her cousin decides he needs to raise her as his own daughter, probably for her protection. The scripture tells us she's beautiful, which maybe at first glance she'd say, oh, that's a nice thing. Well, because she was beautiful, she was put in the pagan king's harem, and poor Mordecai is standing outside the palace gates, just waiting for word of how she's doing and what's happening to her. As a mom and a grandma, I can't even imagine how that must have felt for Mordecai back then. And even today, it doesn't look like she started out great. And I'm not sure, you know, as a parent, you'd say, this is terrible. You know, God, where are you? So I think that we can relate to that because if you've raised kids or, you know, been around a while like I have, there's been several things that have happened that you really did wonder, how is this good? And it's also a blessing to be able to look back and see that God makes all things good. And um, I think the only things that really got me through that, those times um, was prayer. And if you look in the story of Esther, that's exactly what she ends up having to do. She finds out through Mordecai that her people are going to be slaughtered. She's probably going to die along with them because she's Jewish and she's been hiding that fact. Um, she's not married to a good guy. She says, I'm going to pray and fast for three days. And Mordecai, you tell the people to do the same. I think that a lot of times I can try to stay up half the night and try to figure out how this stuff is going to work and feel anxious and whatever else. And finally, I just get up and I get on stairs and I find a rocking chair someplace in the dark and I just talk to God about it. It takes a lot of grit to do that, <laughs> you know, to just pray and pour your heart out to God. Prayer is work. And I think sometimes we just do the easy thing and just try to figure it out ourselves. And I think what God wants us to do is to draw near so that he can draw near to us. The encouragement that um, God offers to me, and I think that he offers to all of us, this is called crackle glass. And um, I love it because it looks like it was broken and it was made into something beautiful. When I put a candle in there, it's, it's beautiful. And I think that um, we're all broken and we all have stories that are broken. And sometimes we just feel like, oh, what a nice Christian family. They don't have any problems. And the scriptures come right out and say that we will have trials. There's not a person out there that hasn't been broken, is being broken, or will be broken. And God makes something beautiful of those things, just like he did for Esther, and using those characteristics that he built into her life um, that seemed horrible, it gave her grit, it gave her patience to wait on God's timing. I don't think I could have given the king and Haman two meals and been polite at the meal and do the things that she did. But she did it because she prayed and she had been through a lot and she knew God was in it. And I think it does the same for us. So that's the encouragement it gives me. And even when I want my children to have everything happy and wonderful, then they're not going to be probably the people that God needs them to be and make them to be. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction to Esther and just seeing your faith lived out in your testimony is an encouragement to me. Now, like Jeff said, this is uh, my last day here, which is sad and a little discouraging, but I don't want to leave on a sad note. Um, I want to encourage you in your faith today, uh, and I just want to take a second to say thank you for the experience this has been for me. I have learned so much in my walk. I've been um, strengthened in my faith. I've learned so many different skills that I'm going to bring on 
into any ministry that God calls me into, and I'm eternally grateful for this experience. And a lot of that learning experience has just been watching how you guys as a church, how Grace Church loves each other and loves others. And that has just been an incredible environment to be part of. And as I think about experiences in our life, it is, it is awesome to be part of an environment where, where, our lo- where the people around us are loving and pouring into us. And just like that experience for me, that has been an incredible time for me. But that doesn't mean my faith hasn't been tested here. Uh, my faith has been tested on multiple different levels. Uh, sometimes it feels like you just get thrown into the fire uh, in ministry. And I've loved that, but my faith has been tested. In fact, no matter whether you're in ministry or outside of ministry, your faith is constantly being tested. You're constantly facing the world. The world is constantly opposing you and tempting you and trying to pull you away from your faith. I think a lot of us can, can see that in the world. I think back in my own life to high school. High school was a time for me where I, I really struggled with learning how to fight uh, the world and, uh, and fight the temptations of the world and learning how to you know, live as a, a good believer in my friend groups and especially on the football team. Right? I loved football, but that was a really hard environment for me to live out my faith and how I lived differently at, at high school than I did at church and wrestling with standing firm in my faith. And I think about my freshman year of college Like, that is the world we live in. When I had that experience, it was like blinds came off. Oh my gosh, this is the world we live in. The very first class of college that I had to take wasn't a class on how to do well in school. It wasn't a class on how to make sure you keep up with your homework or get straight A's. The very first class that I have to take going into a secular college is a one-week course, five sessions, on how to drink safely and how to have safe sex. That is the world we live in. That is the environment that we constantly have to stand firm in. And that can be really, really hard. Our, our blast just ended, and that was an awesome experience for me. I never knew how much fun it was to teach kids. Like, I'm, I'm doing two lessons a day, and I'm loving that. And our main verse through all of blast is Romans 12, 2. When it says, do not be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that first part of it, we talk to these kids about how do you not be conformed to the world? And that is really hard when the world constantly is opposing our faith. It is really hard to stand firm in our faith despite an opposing world. And I don't have to tell you guys this. Right? You live in this world as well. And I think about high school students. Right? You high school students are in an environment where you're constantly being pulled away from your friends. And if you don't look a certain way or act a certain way or say certain things at the right times, you're weird and you're shunned and now you have no friends. And that is really hard to stand firm. I think of college students, right? I shared my college experience. That's the first class that I get into. You can imagine what the rest of my college experience is like. The rest of your guys' college experience, man, that is so difficult when, when the people who are even teaching you are teaching you morals and teaching you different beliefs than what you stand on. And it's really difficult to stand firm in our faith. I think of parents and the pressure that is put on you from the world and how you ought to parent and, and this dynamic of when now, now parents are oppressive to their children when there's authority over them and how difficult it is and how do you parent well and discipline and all these different aspects of parenthood that I don't completely understand but you guys know about. How do I parent? I can't even take my kid to the movie, right? We were talking about picking a movie this week and half the movies we can't even pick because they're pushing agendas and worldly beliefs And man, how do you stand firm as a parent? Or maybe a grandparent as you're looking to your grandkids. Or just men and women all together as citizens of America. How do you stand firm in your faith? I think of women and the pressures that are put on you and the values that you have to have and the identity crisis and the way that you should look. And I think of men and and the values that are pressed on you and and dealing with masculinity and the judgment that you face and the tolerance that you must have. It can be really, really difficult to stand firm 
in your faith, despite an opposing world. And if you're like me, sometimes the world beats you down to the point where you're sitting there and you're saying, man, why? Like, why do I even work this hard at standing firm? It is so difficult. Like, why am I supposed to even do this? Why should I keep trying? It's so hard. And I want to encourage you today with this verse in Romans 5, verse 6 and 8. 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows us his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is why we can stand firm despite an opposing world, because Christ died for you while you were broken. That in our brokenness, when we were part of the world, Christ stood firm in the will of God to the point of death on a cross so that you can have faith. That even the faith that we're able to stand firm in is given to us because of Christ dying on the cross for our sins while we were broken. That still doesn't necessarily make it easy. Right? That's the reason why we're supposed to stand firm in our faith. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's talking to the Corinthian church and he's encouraging them on the fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Right? He's encouraging them in that truth. And he tells them, you know, death, where is your sting? And at the end of this, he encourages them with, with this verse that says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He encourages them to stand firm, to be immovable, and we know how difficult that is. Paul knew how difficult that was, right? Paul was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was persecuted, he received the 40 lashes minus one, and they called it that because at the 40th lash he died. Like, is that not a picture of our world to the fullest extent? It knows exactly how to beat your faith down till you just want to give up. Yet Paul says, stand firm, be immovable. It takes a lot of grace and grit to stand firm in your faith. And the question I want us to answer today is how? How do we stand firm in an opposing world? You might be thinking, I'm not like Paul. Right? Paul is a superhero of the faith. He must have done uh, just, he, he did incredible things. He must have been just a different type of person. I'm not like Paul. Well, Paul was, before uh, he accepted Christ, he hunted down, persecuted, and imprisoned Christians with the hope of them dying. Paul considers himself the worst of sinners. Paul was not a perfect person. Yet he stood firm in his faith despite the entire world opposing him. Our story in Esther today, we're going to see Esther's humanity. Esther, we we sometimes elevate these people in Scripture and sometimes even the people in our lives, and we think of them as these, like, perfect people. And we can't relate to them because they they didn't make mistakes and they stood firm no matter what. But we're going to even see in Esther some some of the hardship that she has in standing firm. I don't even think the people at our church, I think of Pastor Jeff, Right? Pastor Jeff doesn't stand firm in his faith because he's got the biggest biceps I've ever seen on a pastor. Right? He doesn't stand firm in his faith because he's a pastor. Greg Reed doesn't stand firm in his faith because he's an incredible technician and just a really nice guy. Cindy, the testimony that we talked about today, she doesn't stand firm in her faith because her life is all perfect. And I think about Cindy, man, she can stand firm in her faith. I have stolen eight pairs of scissors from Cindy this year. <laughs> this morning, Cindy comes into my office and says, hey, do you know where my pink pair of scissors are? And I said, let me check the desk. And there was three pairs in there. But all the drawers had one pair of scissors in it, which I still have to give back to you, Cindy. Cindy stands firm in her faith. These people in Scripture, Esther stands firm in her faith not because of who they were, but because of who they stood in. We can stand firm in our faith despite an opposing world, no matter what opposes us, because we can stand in God. And we're going to see three foundations of Esther's faith that she chooses to stand on in God today, despite her brokenness. 
We're going to try to get to chapter 4, but to get there, I want to give us some context to help us understand Esther and the situation she was in even better. So in chapter 1, we start off with King Ahasuerus, and we're going to call him King Xerxes for the rest because that's easier to say. His other name was King Xerxes. And King throws this huge party, which ironically, as I'm studying Ruth, there's a lot of same themes between Ruth and Esther and the king. And as I'm studying that, I'm realizing, oh, sorry, not Ruth, Daniel. Daniel and Esther. Daniel and Esther actually lived in the same timeline. And when you follow Daniel's statement of faith and Esther's statement of faith, you see a lot of parallels. Both Daniel and Esther are living in this time where the Jewish people are in exile. And Esther is living under this king, Xerxes, a pagan king, an unbelieving king. And so she's wrestling with, how do I live as a Jew? How do I live as a follower of God and a Persian citizen? And this is the king that she's under. The king throws a huge party in chapter 1, 180 days long. Like, that's a huge party. And at the end of that, he gets done. He's like, you know what? To even show how more, much more powerful I am and how rich I am and how awesome I am, I'm going to throw a six-day party at the end of that 180-day party to just show all of the richest people in my nation how awesome I am. And at the end of that party, he, gets, uh, he goes and talks to his wife, and he's like, hey, Queen Vashti, why don't you come out and show your beauty? And we see that uh, in verse 11. It says, um, the king asks to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the people and the princesses or the princes her beauty. And she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused, refused to come to the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. And the king became enraged and, his, and he burned with anger. He's trying to display his wealth and his power. And then he asks his wife and his wife says, no, I'm not doing that. And in this time, if you didn't have authority over your wife and your life didn't listen to your beck and call, you would be considered powerless. Like that was the lowest level. And so he tells his wife, come out and dance, which, I mean, who knows what he meant by come out and dance. Come out and show your beauty. And rightfully so, she says, you know what? I'm not going to do that. But he's embarrassed and he's angry. And so what does he do? He kicks out the queen. He gets together with his his you know, powerful people, and they come up with this idea to kick the queen out and throw this beauty pageant, right? Because now he has no queen. And that's when we start to see Esther get involved. He gets together and he goes, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to take all of the beautiful virgins away from their families. Like, this is how twisted this king is. I'm going to put them in this beauty pageant, and we see Esther surface in chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, right? His uncle um, and father and mother died. And the young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. We understand that Esther is beautiful, not only in face, but in figure. Every part of her was beautiful. In fact, Esther, or Hadassah, actually means beautiful star. Like, it's, it's ironic to see her name, and of course she's going to stand out. And the king picks her and says, why don't you come into my beauty pageant? But before she joins that, Mordecai tells Esther, right? Mordecai is, is her ter- caretaker. Mordecai tells Esther, hey, don't tell them that you're a Jew. Hide your faith. Which should kind of ring off as a little bell in your mind and saying, really? Hide your faith? I mean, we're talking about standing firm in our faith despite an opposing world, and the first instruction she's given is, don't tell anyone about your faith. We see kind of a breakdown of her faith in the beginning of our book. And then we continue on, right? They, they go through this beautifying process, and um, they're given all these spices and oils, and they look beautiful, and then the king calls them in one by one. And it reads this in verse 13. When the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from harem to the king's palace. Not a terrible deal. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in the custody of Shagai. Shagai, however you say that word. (laughs) Notice this detail. In the evening she would go in, 
and in the morning she would return. There's a lot more than premarital eye contact going on. We see her faith broken down again. We see her humanity. We see her depravity at play. She is a Jew, and she chooses to hide her faith. Then she gets chosen by the king, forced to go through this beautifying process, and then instead of standing firm, she sleeps with the king, which would have broken her, her faith on multiple different levels, would have broken the law on multiple different levels. Not only was he um, a pagan, he would have been uncircumcised, and they would have been defiling herself outside of marriage, right? On multiple different accounts, she breaks down her faith. And we can start to relate to Esther in her brokenness, in her difficult situation. She's facing a world that is not believing what she believes, that opposes her beliefs on every level, and she struggles to stand firm. How often do I struggle to stand firm? How many times have I defiled myself before God in my brokenness? Yet we get to chapter 4 and we see Esther take this massive stand on her faith despite the opposition. Chapter 3 kind of sets up chapter 4 with us when we realize that Mordecai, right, her cousin, her caretaker, just like Cindy mentioned, would sit outside and wait for anything that Esther would share. And he, and he stands outside, he's one of the king's servants, out, outside the king's gate every day. And we're introduced to this man named Haman. I know there's a lot of information, but we introduce this man named Haman. And Haman is like the king's right-hand man. Like right underneath the king when it comes to power. And he is all about himself. Like worship me, look at me. I'm basically like the king. Don't no one oppose me. And every time he goes out of the king's gate, everyone bows. Except for Mordecai. Because Mordecai was a Jew. And he was only going to bow to God. And so Haman hates the Jews, right? Mordecai, you're opposing my authority. I hate you. In fact, I hate you so much that I'm going to go to the king and I'm going to tell him, let's kill all the Jews. We remember that Queen Esther is a Jew, which means that she would have been included in this genocide. And Mordecai is terrified. Mordecai goes to her with a desperate ask for help. In verse 8, we see Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, for the Jewish genocide, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Man, Mordecai, you told me to... You told me to not share my faith, and now everyone's life is on the line, including mine, and now you want me to go stand firm? How is Esther going to stand firm in her faith? How can we stand firm in our faith when our entire culture and world opposes us? If Esther goes into the king's palace to plea, and he doesn't put out his scepter, she dies. Like, that's the risk involved. Not only is she risking the lives of all the Jews, but she's risking her life and her position of authority as the queen. And at any moment, she could die for this. How does Esther stand firm in this moment? And we're going to see that in, in what Mordecai reminds her of her faith. We're going to see three specific foundations of Esther's faith that she chooses to stand firm in that allows her to stand firm in her faith despite an opposing world. We start off in verse 12, when Mordecai uh, talks to Esther and says, Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Don't think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all of the Jews. The first thing Mordecai reminds Esther in is that her security isn't in her queenhood. Her security isn't in the position she's in. Her security is in God. The first foundation that we have to stand on, that we have to have our faith founded in, if we want to stand firm despite an opposing world, world, is we have to realize our security is in God and in God only. He's talking to Esther and he's like, Look, Esther, you're in this position. 
I know it's not ideal. I know your life is on the line. But just realize that you're not going to escape because of your position. Right, Esther, your beauty isn't going to get you through this one. The fact that you're a queen isn't going to get you through this one. You are going to die if you don't stand up for this. Man, is it really so difficult to see God's security sometimes when the world is opposing us. But when we choose to realize that our security is in God and his promises, we can stand firm. Esther would have known the promises that were given to King David 400 years prior. And the fact that there will become a redeemer out of the Jewish line. And so therefore, the Jewish line must continue. And Mordecai even reminds her of this in the next verse. Right? The Jewish line must continue. And so, you know what? Your security is in the fact that a redeemer is coming. Our security, Grace Church, is in the fact that that redeemer came. We were given a faith because of that redeemer, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross. My very first encouragement to you, while you were still sinners, he died for you. We have a security that we cannot lose no matter what happens, and that is our salvation and our residency in the kingdom of God. When we're rooted in that security, it doesn't matter what opposes us. Your money in this world isn't your security. The amount of zeros that you have in a bank account, you cannot find your security in that. The amount of friends that you have, you're not going to have your security in that. They will fail you. The amount of followers you have on Instagram, the amount of jokes you make, the amount of people that think you're awesome. I cannot find my security in the amount of people that come up and tell me I did a good job today. If I find my security in the applause or if I find my security in anything other than God, I will not stand firm in my faith. Which I know some of you are not thinking, should we not tell them they did a good job? Should we, you know... <laughs> But it's true. Like, I can find my security in those things. But then throughout the week, when the world opposes me and sin comes knocking on the door and the temptation rises, I'm not going to stand firm. I have to stand firm in the security of God. And that's exactly what Esther has to realize. That nothing is going to let her escape this other than God and his plan. And that's where we see the next foundation of her faith. Remember, Mordecai reminds her that, look, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise uh, of all the Jews from another place. He's like, look, the Jews are going to live. If you don't keep silent at this time, though, you and your father's house will die. And then he says this, and who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is where we see the second foundation of Esther's faith, and that is that she trusts in the sovereignty of God. She realizes that maybe she's in a position, and and we would call these Esther moments, in fact, John Piper calls these Esther moments, these moments where the entire world seemingly opposes us, yet we have to stand firm. She's in this Esther moment because of God and his sovereignty. And sometimes in our lives, when we're, we're wrestling with the world and we're struggling to stand firm, it can get really easy to think, ah, man, where is God? Just like Cindy mentioned this morning in her testimony, where's God? In fact, in the whole book of Esther, God's name is never mentioned once. Yet we see God's working throughout the entire book. The fact that Queen um, Esther is a Jew is a minority in that people group because she was in exile, is a part of the hated people group now, and she just happens to be the queen of Persia, is not by coincidence. It's God's providence. We even see God's providence in Mordecai's story as you, realize, if you, as you study Mordecai's story. Mordecai and Haman were at odds, and Haman is set out to kill Mordecai no matter what happens. He builds huge gallows for Mordecai to get hanged on. And at the end of our story, we realize that Haman gets hanged on those gallows, not Mordecai. Yet God's name is never mentioned. We see that in Ruth. Right? We talked about Ruth last week. She just happened to come upon the field of Boaz. No, that's not, that's not by coincidence. It's God's sovereignty. That's God's plan at work. 
When we realize that God's plan is at work, we realize that these moments in our lives are opportunities to be used by God. When we trust in the sovereignty of God, we can stand firm in our faith no matter what opposes us because we realize that God's plan is going to happen regardless of what people say, regardless of what people do. And when we understand that, we realize that those Esther moments are opportunities to be used by God. So Esther's working through this. Right? Mordecai tells her, look, you need to have your security in God, not in your position. We need to have our security in God, not our position. Look, you need to have and understand that God is at work here, that, that the sovereignty of God is at play. And God is working in this moment. In fact, you are in this moment because of God's workings, because of God's hand. We need to trust in the sovereignty of God to stand firm to oppose in an opposing world. And then the third step of her faith, the third foundation that she roots herself in is that she is willing to sacrifice everything. And those first two foundations kind of give us a motivation for this third foundation. Because of God's security, and we realize that the only thing that we have that we can never lose is the kingdom of God and what Jesus has given us, when we realize that God's hand is always moving, his sovereignty, and he is in control of everything, the next thing we have to do is is come to a place in our heart where we have to say, I'm going to sacrifice everything. We see Esther do that in verse 16. She responds and she says, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go into the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. When the world is opposing us, do you have a mentality that says, I will stand firm in my faith even if it means I die? Is that the mentality we have? If we want to stand firm, we have to be willing to sacrifice it all. You have to be willing to say, you know what, I don't care what happens to my bank account. I don't care what happens to my money. I don't care what happens in my friend groups. I don't care if I lose my friends. I don't care if I lose my family over this. I don't care if people think that I look weird or that I'm I'm stupid for making these decisions. I don't care if I lose every social influence I have. I don't care because I'm going to trust in the security of God and the sovereignty of God, and I'm going to take the next step and be willing to sacrifice it all so I can stand firm in my faith. You have to be willing to sacrifice it all. And Esther is a beautiful picture of this. Right? Esther willingly chooses to say, I'm going to sacrifice it all. She goes to the king, and the king grants her what she wishes. And it's an incredible story of God's perseverance and God's protection over his people. Esther willingly sacrifices. But we have a better example, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ not only willingly sacrificed, but he lost it all the same one that gives us this faith that we can stand firm in despite the world, sacrificed and lost everything. I think it's interesting when you look at the imagery here in Esther, right? She is in a position in the kingdom. She is in a royalty position and she willingly sacrifices that position to identify with her, with her people so that they can be preserved. And it's really cool when you look at what Jesus did. Right? Jesus sacrifices his position in the kingdom of heaven to identify with us on earth so that we can be preserved through his death and resurrection. Our Savior went from God to man, man to servant, servant to death. I love that phrase. It puts it in a full picture. He willingly sacrificed it all so that you could stand firm in the security of God and his sovereignty. For us to stand firm in an opposing world, we have to have a faith that is rooted in, first, the security of God, the sovereignty of God. God's hand is always moving. And then we have to be willing to give it all up. 
just like Jesus did. And that can be really, really hard. Easier said than done. I think of the Bible verse that I shared with you in the beginning. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as I'm thinking about that verse, and I'm thinking about the last point, willing to sacrifice it all, yesterday, this is literally last night, I'm studying this, sacrifice, sacrifice, willing sacrifice, and this verse comes to mind, right? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I'm like, that is perfect. And what is the next verse after that? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. If we want to not be conformed to this world, if we want to stand firm despite an entire world that opposes everything we believe in those moments, in those Esther moments, you have to live and offer yourself self up as a living sacrifice. And I challenge you to do that because of what God can do through you when you choose to stand firm. Stand firm. When you look through scripture, you see constant examples of when people stand firm in their Esther moments, God uses them to do incredible things and God can use you despite your brokenness. Maybe this is the hundredth time you've had this moment and you're realizing, you know what? I'm probably just gonna fail again and conform. I encourage you to stand firm in that moment because if it's just that one time, God can use you to have eternal impact. God can use you, Grace Church, to have eternal impact. He used Daniel when he said, I'm not going to eat the food. I'm not going to defile myself. And he stood against the king. God uses him when he stands firm in his faith to have impact in the king's court for 80 years. God uses Esther and and her Esther moment, right? God uses Esther when, when she stands firm in her faith to save her people from genocide, to preserve the line of Jesus. God used Paul when he stood firm in his faith despite the beatings, despite the world opposing him to the fullest extent. He stood firm and he spreads the gospel and writes 13 books of the New Testament. And God wants to use you in the same way. God wants to use you when you stand firm despite an opposing world. And God can use you in your brokenness. Maybe you've made mistakes in the past and you can relate to Esther today. God wants to use you when you stand firm despite an opposing world to have eternal impact for his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, I'm not sure where everyone's coming from today. Everyone showed up this morning with different lives and different pasts and different struggles. And it can get really hard, Lord, for me to stand firm in my faith. But I pray that this would be an encouragement to Grace Church this morning as much as it is encouragement to me. I pray that we would leave here encouraged to stand firm. Amidst our brokenness, Lord, I thank you for sending your son to die for me so that I can have this faith to stand firm in. I pray that we would live and have a faith like Esther's faith. Have a faith like Jesus. We would live in the security, Lord, of what you've done on that cross and what you've given us. That we'd accept what you've given us as true. That we would realize that what you've given us cannot be taken away. And we see, God, your handiwork through all of Scripture, and we trust in your sovereignty today, despite our situation. Lord, I pray that we would take the next step and be willing to sacrifice it all. I pray that you would continue to do amazing things to this church as you've done this summer, using these people who stand firm in their faith to have eternal impact for your kingdom. Pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys can please stand and worship with us as we sing praise the Father, praise the Son. Oh, sovereign God, oh, matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before the throne of grace. To you belongs the highest praise. He suffers this path.
passing time under your wings I will abide and every enemy shall flee you are my hope and victory praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Gabe. Can we show our appreciation to Gabe? And Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we love you, Gabe, and we are definitely going to miss you. So, yeah, God bless you as you continue serving him. Gabe's going on to New York City where he's going to be working part-time in a church and continuing his education and a great opportunity for him. So we're excited for him and, and going to miss him. But you never know how the Lord cr causes our paths to cross, and uh, you never know what he might have for us in the future. So we're glad, so glad that you got to be with us this summer. Well, I have discovered in, in my life that I stand firm best in an opposing world when I'm connected with you all. And so we have some great opportunities to help you foster those connections. Just want to keep you uh, up to speed with our sign-up sheet out in the foyer. We're going to have our groups launching in another month or so. And so just be keeping those opportunities on your radar as we prepare for the fall. would encourage you, if you haven't downloaded our app, you want that app and you want to keep checking that, we, we update that to keep opportunities and uh, registrations that, that you can um, take advantage of online so that you can get connected. Jamie and I will be starting a Discover Grace class. And so if you're new to Grace, you're interested in becoming a member, you're interested in baptism, or you just want to learn more about our, our church, or if you just want to come to my house and harass me, we would love to have you. So 
uh, please please sign up for that. Several of you have, have already done that. Uh, so excited that you could be with us this morning. And if you are new to us at all, if you haven't received a gift, please stop by the welcome counter. We would love to be able to, to send you off with a gift today just to, to show our appreciation for you coming to, and joining us at Grace Baptist Church. So may God bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We'll see you next week.